In the last video, we figured out exactly where we want to position this Cummins and this Explorer chassis, and we even added a small body lift to make it fit. And now in this episode, let's get the drivetrain mounts fabricated so that we can actually get this massive drivetrain into this tiny Explorer. These are the Cummins motor mounts, which bolt onto the engine. And then these are the motor mounts that I cut out of the Ram frame. So these need to get welded to the Explorer frame. Now, the challenge is going to be the position of these dictates the position of the engine. So I need to make sure that its front to back distance is correct as well as its up and down position, but I also need to make sure that the angles of it are correct too. I need to make sure that it's angled this way such that the angle of the engine matches the angle of the rear end so I don't get any drive shaft vibrations. I need to make sure that the engine is angled properly this way, which should just be straight up and down. And then of course I need to make sure it's parallel with the chassis so not angled that way. So the challenge in this video of course is going to be making sure that when I cut these up and weld them to the frame, that I end up with the engine in the perfect spot. Typically you want the engine in the center of the chassis. In my case, I'm gonna to have to offset it just slightly because of the transmission tunnel and the Explorer's offset slightly. But if you do offset it, you wanna make sure that you're still within the working limits of your, your joints. So you wanna, you wanna check that. I felt as though I should elaborate a little bit here. If you have your engine and transmission here and your axle here, and the engine and transmission's offset slightly in the car. For example, if this distance here is one inch, like it is in my case, and this distance here, I don't know yet, but let's just assume is something like 36 inches, then we wanna make sure that this angle right there is less than three and a half degrees in order for the U-joint to work. So, for what offsets and lengths does this work? Well, I made a quick Excel spreadsheet. Right here we can see our shaft lengths. Right here we can see for a one inch offset or a two inch offset. And you can see if I have a one inch offset, I could have a shaft as short as 18 inches and I'm still okay. For a two inch offset, it has to be about 36 inches. So if you were wondering how much offset would be acceptable for you, then you can take a look at this table. It's a quick, simple way to figure out if your offset on your engine is acceptable or not. Let's get back to the garage. What I need to do now is set this in the chassis and rig it up in such a way that all of those dimensions are where I need them to be. And then once they are, I'll start cutting up those motor mounts and start welding all the stuff on. I've got this very close to where it's supposed to be sitting. You can see I have it mounted higher than it's normally supposed to go. I'll uh, cut this off and reinforce it down below so that it still has three mounting points. Right now it only has two mounting points. I will modify this mount slightly, but that's where this is going to be sitting. As you can see, the motor mount and the steering shaft are trying to occupy the same space. So that is definitely not gonna work. To fix this power steering problem, I think I have two options and I'm not sure which one I'm gonna go with yet. The first one would be I can use the ram pump, but just move it down and further back. And then I might be able to shoot the steering over the motor mount. So that would be my first option, mount it something like this. But if that doesn't work, if this is still in the way, the other thing I can do is that in the late 70s, the Broncos and F-150s actually had a steering box that went on the outside of the frame. So if I got one of those steering boxes, it'll just be 17 bucks at a junkyard. I can throw that on the outside of the frame and then it's really completely out of the way. I won't interfere with the engine in any way. I won't interfere with the motor mounts. So for now, I'm just going to assume that one of these two solutions is gonna fit, either moving the Ram box down or putting a Bronco box on the outside of the frame. I'm gonna assume that one of those is gonna work and I'm just going to put the engine in the chassis. So. I just wanted to address this because I'm sure somebody's gonna be telling me I'm not gonna have any room for steering. I have thought about it. I do have a few options. We'll look at that in a later video.
All right, I've got both these motor mounts tacked onto here. As you can see here, I actually made a bit of a mistake. There's a big gap here. There's a big gap there. And the reason why is because when I cut all this to make it form to that, I actually had the rotation of it slightly wrong. So it's a good thing that I had it bolted to the engine before I tacked it on here, but these are tacked up. Before I finish weld them out, what I want to do is get the transmission mount set on here as well so that I can make sure that the, both the engine and the transmission are in their final spot before I do the finish weld on all these. This will end up getting a plate here to reinforce it, connect it to there, as will the back of that mount, as well as some plating here. When I box the frame, there's gonna be tons of extra plating that's gonna happen on all this stuff. But for now, I wanna get the engine and transmission set in the chassis, so I need to do the transmission mount. And I also need to bolt the transmission to the engine. I'm just gonna get the transmission bolted up, and then I'm gonna set this in the chassis and do the transmission mount. Look how pretty she is. This whole drivetrain setup, it's beautiful. It's perfect for an Explorer. So, I managed to get this transmission cross member out of the Dodge truck. It was difficult to film, so I didn't, and now I've got it out. Next thing to do is to pressure wash this, but I need some lunch first. So, I will get back to you guys after I do that, and for now, just admire this beautiful thing. This is what the mounting system looks like for the transmission on the transmission cross member. This bolts to the transmission, and then this mount with the rubber damper in it bolts to the cross member. The good thing about this setup is I actually get a little bit of adjustability on this cross member. See, I can slide it back and forth that much, and I guess I could even rotate it if I needed, but. That's nice because it gives me that bit of adjustability. That's this thing. Let's get this thing modified so that it can bolt to the chassis. I spent a bunch of time faffing about with this. I was cutting it and everything, trying to make it work. I was gonna, I was gonna make this piece so that it bolts on there so that I can unbolt the whole cross member and pull it out from the car. And I was messing around with this, trying to get it to work. And these bolt holes still weren't lining up perfect. And I was thinking I was gonna have to cut new bolt holes. and. Then I remembered that age old engineering principle, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. So this, screw it. I have a big section, a quarter inch angle iron, and I'm just gonna cut that and run that for the transmission cross member. It's plenty strong enough. This is quarter inch, all that stuff was eighth inch. This will work great. So don't forget, Keep it simple, stupid. If a, port, if a piece of angle iron will function perfectly well in your application, just use a piece of angle iron. Don't screw around with anything fancy. So the one thing I will have to do is that when I bolt this to the bottom of the chassis, it's gonna be a little bit low for the mount. So I will still cut off this piece of the cross member and weld it onto here so that I get the height that I need in order to make the angle of the engine ma match the angle of the rear end so that I don't get any drive trap drive shaft vibrations, but other than cutting that and welding it there, it's just gonna be a piece of angle iron spanning the two, a couple bolts on either side. Should be easy.
I wanted to mention real quick why I decided to go with three bolt holes rather than just two. I don't want to fill this thing completely up with fasteners because it's a pain in the butt when you have to take them off if you have to undo 30 fasteners, but I did think three was worth it. So if this thing is going to fail, it's going to fail right here on this end that's skinny and sticks out. But the reason that I have to make this skinny part that sticks out and cut off this is because I want to be able to pull it out from underneath the chassis from below. Once the body's on and everything, I can't pull it out above. I have to pull it out below. So that's why it looks like this. Now it's quarter inch plate. I think it's pretty unlikely to have an issue, but if it does have an issue, it's going to bend here. Now, if I only had one row of bolts, then the plate is sitting on that bolt and it's fixed. It actually still has a lot of ability to bend, but if I have two rows of bolts, then it, when it tries to bend, this part it's lifting up on. So it's a lot closer to a true cantilever having the two points rather than the one, and the one point is going to allow a lot more bending in this. So hopefully just adding that one extra bolt adds quite a bit of rigidity to this end piece. That's the idea anyways. Now let's get the mounting points on the chassis done up. Now that I've got the mount for the transmission welded onto the cross member, the next thing I want to weld is I want to weld these nuts onto the chassis right here. The reason I want to do that is because when I box this frame later, I definitely want to be able to box this spot because it's going to be really important that this spot's strong. So once I put a plate here, I'm not going to be able to get to these nuts anymore, so I need to have them welded onto the frame. However, there's an issue. These are the nuts I have and they're zinc plated. These nuts here are galvanized. They're zinc plated. And the problem with that is if you get this really hot, it lets off a fume that's really, really toxic and not just toxic to the state of California where you're gonna get cancer in 30 years, maybe, but actually toxic as in, if you do enough of it, you might wake up dead. So. Obviously this amount of zinc isn't going to kill you, but you want to be really careful when welding on galvanized stuff or, or with zinc or magnesium. So what I need to do is I need to remove the zinc layer. These are really difficult to hold when you're trying to use a wire wheel or anything on them. So the way that I'm going to remove the zinc layer on these is I'm just going to bolt them one by one to this and then I can actually get the wire wheel in and get all of that zinc coating off. I know I'm not gonna be able to get 100% of it off, so I'm also gonna wear my respirator and I'm gonna leave the door open. Again, that might be overkill. This is only a tiny amount of zinc, but you really don't wanna screw around with this stuff too much. Even just a mild dose, you'll have the worst headache of your life. You feel like have a huge hangover. I don't even wanna go through that. I'd rather just wear a respirator and keep the door open. So just in case I'm taking those extra precautions, be very careful with zinc plated stuff. By the way, if you're doing this, Make sure when you put the wire wheel on it, 
the direction it's hitting it isn't loosening. Because it might take this nut and shoot it across your shop. Don't ask me how I know that. Well, I screwed up. These aren't zinc coated nuts. They're just zinc nuts. So no amount of wire welding is going to get the zinc out of this. Good thing I hit it with the wire wheel and the grinder before I tried to weld this on because that would have been a nasty mess if I had attempted to weld it. So I'm going to have to go to the store and I'll just pick up some good old steel nuts. Not plated, hopefully. Well, I should have waited for that to cool down before I tried to take it out because I just broke that bolt off in there. That sucks. I'm hoping when it cools down, I'll be able to just spin it out with a vice grip, but we'll see. I guess that means the welds are good though, if I'll break the bolt before I break the welds. Always a silver lining. tap through it and she's fixed, so let's go. The other ones I should be able to reach a little easier, so that should have been the hardest one, but I'm not gonna make them so tight before I weld them next time, and I'm also not gonna loosen it until it's actually cool so that it doesn't break again. What do you think, YouTube? Should I keep the bell housing raw aluminum? Should I paint it to paint it black to kind of match the rest of this? Kind of like the Harlequin look. Maybe it looks too unfinished though. There it is, all bolted up to the car. On each of these, I went ahead and ran a tap through them just to make sure that from welding them, the heat didn't distort them or there was no spatter inside of them or anything like that. I also made sure to paint underneath the frame where I bolted it up so I won't get any rust spots there. And then for now, underneath the transmission, I just have a stack of five washers on each side. The size of this stack of washers is actually what dictates the angle of the engine. And that angle needs to match the angle of the rear axle. So once I have everything finalized on this, no more cherry picker once I get the motor mount finished, then I'm gonna replace those washers with a spacer that I turn on the lathe. But for now, I'm gonna use the washers so that I can do some really fine adjustment on the angle. For now, there's that cross member. I think it turned out really nice. It's super simple, super beefy, should work well. Turned out a lot better than trying to cut up the old, trying to cut up the old cross member from the RAM. And I think this part of it turned out really well and everything too. So happy with this cross member, should work well. Now let's get the motor mounts figured out. For now, that's enough welds to hold these together. Once I box the frame, I'm also going to plate those a little bit, like plate the back of this one that has a gap. I just don't have the metal to do it right now, so when I box the frame, I'll add some reinforcements to make sure these are welded on all sides. But for now, this is plenty to hold the engine in. Let's get on to modifying the motor mounts. got a small problem here. These motor mounts are obviously cast. Now I don't know if they're cast iron or cast steel. Now I wanted to make sure I was going to be okay to weld it, 
So I ran a test bead on this one, and the bead ran well. But if you listen closely, you can hear some popping. From that thing. So that tells me I'm gonna need to be careful when I do these welds. There is a risk here that because these are cast, I'm going to crack them if I weld them. But I'm gonna try and be careful. I'll try to preheat them. I'll try to make sure they cool down slowly and we'll see what happens. But it's gonna be a little hard to preheat these because they have a rubber bushing in there. But this material might complicate how I was gonna do this. I didn't actually think about it until just now, but that might make this hard. But I guess we'll see. Let's find out. It sure looks like steel to me, not iron. When I grind it, the sparks aren't quite as long. The sparks look like they might not have as long of trails quite, but they're a very similar color. They, um, they branch off at the end of the spark. It looks like those are basically putting off the same spark, just very slightly different. So I'm pretty sure it's cast steel, not cast iron, which means I'm still gonna preheat and I'm still gonna be careful with a little bit of post heat but I think I'll be okay. It's not gonna be as picky as cast iron would be. Now my biggest concern is just the fact that there's a rubber bushing in there. So I'll have to be careful I don't preheat the whole thing too much because then I'll destroy the bushing. So I'm gonna throw these in the oven while I grab lunch, see how that does. These hot little potatoes have been sitting all night, cooling off slowly in a pile of clothes. Let's see if they happen to be cracked right through or not. I didn't bother cleaning off any of the flux on them or anything. So they're still covered in flux. And no obvious cracks yet. Oh, I missed a weld. Crap, I was in too much of a hurry, I missed that weld. There's a weld on the other side, so it should be fine, but that's a shame. Got a couple holes to drill in each of these and a little bit of shaping with a cutoff wheel and grinder, and then these will be good to go. And I gotta clean all the flux off, so let's clean these up and drill some holes in them and do a little shaping. Let's go.
Here she is, transfer case, transmission, Cummins. 6PT, NV4500, NP241, DHD. This is a hell of a drivetrain for this little Explorer and I'm excited about it. And now it's finally sitting in the car. There's still a couple things that need done. I need to get the suspension I'm going to be using underneath the car, the lift springs and shocks and all that so that I can make sure that in its final resting position that the driveline angles and everything are all right. But once I get that suspension for my old Explorer, I'll be able to do that. She's, she's done. The drivetrain's in there. So next I need to box the frame, install the fuel system, install the brakes, shorten some drive shafts, but I'm not sure when I'm gonna do that, and then throw the body back on. Once I get the body back on, there's the steering, the clutch, and the throttle I need to hook up. And then it'll pretty much be drivable. Obviously it won't be finished. There's a lot of stuff I still need to do after that point, but it'll at least be drivable. And running and driving is the goal right now. I can do all the other mods and finish up making all the gauges work and all that fun stuff later. I want to get it running and driving as quick as I can. So. A lot of progress in this video, and so if you like this build and you want to see the rest of it, then subscribe and stick around. Thanks for watching this far, and leave a like if you liked it, and thanks for hanging out in my garage with me today. I'll see you next time.